And we'll begin by opening up the verse in the Torah that describes the, the that describes the experience of the Ten Commandments. So first the Torah tells us what they heard, what God spoke. And then we hear about the sort of what it felt to, what what it what it felt to, what what it, what it was like to be there. So this is this week's parsha, the seventh reading, Exodus chapter twenty, verse fifteen. And all the people saw the voices and the torches, the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. And the people saw and trembled, so they stood from afar. So you had. Uh, voices, torches, there was fire, there was sound of the shofar, there was smoke on the mountain, all kinds of a whole fireworks show. The people are frightened, they stand back, and they continue to tell Moshe, we don't want to hear from God, you can speak to us, please don't, we don't want to hear from God, we may die. In other words, it was a very overwhelming experience. Okay, but if you examine the, very carefully the words in verse 15, and all the people saw the voices and the torches, Okay, that sounds reasonable. But what happens if I stop and I say, all the people saw the voices? All the people saw the voices. So how do you see voices? Well, you could say, well, don't stop there. Read, the people saw the voices and the torches. We didn't really see the voice. We saw the torch. We saw the fire. You can't see the voice, right? So it turns out that there's a big dispute in the Medrash between two great sages, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, what the meaning of this verse is. Did they see the voices? I don't know how that's possible. Or did they see the torches, but they heard the voices? That is the dispute. What we're going to do is we want to analyze this dispute, figure out what the mystical meaning, what the application of that is, and we go a step further in explaining the connection between the specific opinions and the sages who offer these, these opinions. So we're going to get into the idea that the sage offering an opinion, it's really a reflection of his own spiritual state. And that's why they gravitate to the various interpretations. So that is sort of the background verse. And we'll take a moment and then we'll look at the, we'll open up the Rebbe's talk, which quotes the Medrash and brings this interesting, interesting uh, disagreement. Now, there is another disagreement but with, between the same two people. And what, what, what this talk is going to do is trying to explain both disagreements and then say how they're consistent and why whoever says A in this disagreement one has to say A in disagreement two. Now, I don't know if we're going to get into that because I don't know if it's, it may be too much to, to bite off in one, in one hour. But just in case we want to get into it, we're going to put out that disagreement as well. Uh, what is the what 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 is the what is the what is the second disagreement that we we want to address? So if you look at the opening statement of the Ten Commandments, we just read the final statement. In other words, after the Ten Commandments, we read the description of the experience. But if you look at the opening statement of the Ten Commandments, it says as follows: uh, Genesis Exodus chapter twenty verse one, God spoke all these words. By God spoke all these words. And in verse two, we have the Ten Commandments. But then there's a tricky word. The word is lemor. Lemor is to say. It's a, it's, a, it's a very common verse in the Torah. Every time God speaks to Moses, it says, by Daber Hashem and Moshe, lemor. God spoke to Moshe to say. Meaning to say, when God communicates to Moshe, it's not for Moshe. It's for Moshe to repeat it to the people. That's, that's, the, that's the, the typical interpretation of the word lemor, to say. Amar is say, lemor is to say. The problem here is that all the Jewish people are gathered at Sinai. So God spoke all these words to the Jewish people. So what does to say mean? To say to who? Who else needs to hear it? We all heard it. And the Medrash goes on to say, not only the Jewish people at the time heard it, but really the souls of every Jew of all times were at Sinai. So we all heard it. So what is the meaning of the word lemur to say? To say to who? So there are all kinds of interpretations. One interpretation that this English translation takes is to say is not to say, it's to respond. God says these words, and God says, no, what do you think? And the Jewish people have to respond, I'm the Lord your God. Okay, yes, we accept. 
So in other words, it wasn't just God projecting his voice or God imposing his view. He wanted a response. He wanted the people to accept it. That's what the Medrash says. And the Medrash says that this is a disagreement. What do you respond to the Ten Commandments? So one opinion says, whatever God says, you say, yes, don't murder, yes. Don't murder, don't steal, yes. I'm the Lord your God, yes. Keep Shabbat, yes. You say yes to everything. That's one opinion. And the other opinion says, no, it depends. The, the Ten Commandments are divided to positive commandments and, and negative commandments. So when God says a positive commandment, rest on Shabbat, you say yes. When God says honor your parents, you say yes. But then when God says the, la the last five, which are all no's, do not uh, murder, do not commit adultery, do not, do not steal, say, you don't say yes, say no. Don't, do, do not murder. No, I'm not going to murder. So this is a bit, this is the debate. We we'll start with that debate. This is the debate. What if, what's the, what are the ramifications? What's the difference if you say yes to yes, yes to everything or yes to the positive and no to the, and no, and no to the negative? It seems like it's completely irrelevant. And what's the difference? Essentially, you're accepting it. But as we will see, if we get to it, it's very significant. And it ties into the other disagreement of do we see the sounds or do we see the voices? So there's a lot of moving parts here. It's a, it's a relatively long talk, but it's, it's, really, it's really enjoyable. So I hope, uh, I hope that we'll be able to uh, um, journey through and uh, enjoy, some, uh, enjoy the ride, like we said. So again, we have two disagreements. We're going to analyze each one separately. We're going to start with the second one because in other words, we're going to spend more time on the second one. But then we, if we have time, we'll go back to the first. If not, just come back next year. Uh, God willing, same time, same place, good health. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do the full thing. Okay, so, um, whoops. Okay, so this is um, the first one I'm just gonna quote. I'm just gonna quote the first, the, the, the second disagreement that I said, which appears first in the talk. The Mechilta relates a difference in opinion regarding Mechilta a Medrash. The Mechilta relates a difference of opinion regarding the way the Jews express their acceptance of the commandments. Because remember earlier, it says that it says that God said, said the Ten Commandments saying it. They have to respond. So how do they respond? So Rabbi Yishmael states that they answered yes to the positive commandments and no to the negative ones. By saying yes to the commandments that involve their taking action, they imply that they would do what was asked of them. And by responding no to the commandments that involve their refrain from action, they promise that they would not do what God prohibited. So that's the first disagreement. Uh, uh, first opinion, Rabbi Shmuel says, when God says do, they say yes. When God says don't murder, they say no, meaning we're not going to do it. Rabbi Akiva, by contrast, maintains that they answered yes to all the commandments, saying yes to the positive commandments and yes to the negative commandments. This reply signified their willingness to fulfill each of God's commandment as required. Right? I say, don't murder. I say, yes. I don't mean I'm going to murder. I say, yes, means I'll do what you say. If you say, don't murder, I won't murder. If you say, rest on Shabbat, I'll rest on Shabbat. It makes no difference if it's positive or negative. You say, yes. This is a, a, a disagreement. It seems like it's, it's just sitting here just to kill time. In other words, it seems like whatever one rabbi says, the other one's going to say the opposite. What's the difference if you say yes to everything or yes or no? But as we will see, this disagreement could be profound in, in your attitude toward fulfilling all of the commandments. Okay, we will put that aside. We may or may not get back to it. Put that on the back burner. Now we go to the second disagreement, which we started with, okay? So there is another difference of opinion between these two sages, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva, regarding the giving of the Torah. On the verse, all the people saw the sounds and the flames, right? We saw the verse, we read the verse. Kol ha'am, all the people saw the sounds. Ro'im takolot, they saw the sounds. Question is, how do you see sounds? Rabbi Ishmael states that the people saw what is usually seen, and heard what is usually heard. In other words, don't get bent out of shape. It doesn't mean they saw sounds. It means that they saw the flames and they heard the sounds, even though the verse doesn't say that, but that's the way you should understand it. In, this re in his reading, the verb saw does not apply to the object sounds, which immediately follows it, but only to flames, the second object of the, of the verb in the verse. He maintains that the sounds, something that is usually heard, were heard, not seen. Right? Let's jump back to the verse just that you can see it. Whoops. Let's jump back to the verse that's just that you can see it. The verse says, all the people saw the voices, saw the sounds and torches. Rabbi Ishmael says, the people didn't see the voices, even though it says they did. No. Saw refers to torches. The people saw the torches. They heard the sounds. They, in other words, in his formulation, they saw what is usually seen and they heard what is usually heard. Simple. Don't get bent out of shape. Um, when you get to the second opinion, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, however, maintains 
that the verb's direct object is also its semantic object. According to his understanding, the giving of a Torah brought about an upheaval within the natural order. The people saw what is usually heard and heard what is usually seen. Sounds that are by nature heard were seen and flames which are seen were heard. Rabbi Akiva says, look, you got to read the verse. The verse says they saw the sounds. What does that tell you? They saw what is usually seen. They heard what is usually, they saw, I'm sorry, they saw what is usually heard. They saw the sounds and they heard what is usually seen. They heard the flames. That's what Rabbi Akiva says. What does this even mean? And why is this important? And why would God make a miracle to, uh, to, to make this great upheaval in the world is a wonderful question. So we're going to get to that. But first, but, but that's the basis. The basis is what did Rabbi Ishmael say? What did Rabbi Akiva say? Rabbi Ishmael says, and later, as, my, as I alluded to, we're going to explain why Rabbi Ishmael says what he says. But first, we have to figure out what, the, what, what is the meaning of what they say. So Rabbi Ishmael says, at Mount Sinai, everything is natural. They saw what is seen. They saw the, tur- the, the, the torches. They heard the voices. Rabbi Akiva says, they heard what is, they heard the voice. They, they saw the voices. It's a strange opinion, but that's what the verse says. They saw the voices and, and the torches. Oh, yeah, they heard the torches because they saw what is usually heard and they heard what is usually seen. We want to unpack that statement and figure out what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean first of all, it doesn't mean literal, but even if it does mean literal, what does it mean spiritually? What is the significance of all of this? So that is where we're heading. Um, any comments, jokes, questions, jump in. Otherwise, the train continues. In the meantime, we're going to say the Chaim because it's to get us get to get us warmed up. Maybe, maybe that's what he's saying. Comes, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yes. So, um, so seeing is a euphemism for is another word, not a euphemism, is a syn- synonym for wisdom, right? In English and Hebrew too, but in English you're talking about enlightenment. What is enlightenment? Oh, you have wisdom, you're enlightened, you understand. Because the ability to see something is the ability to understand, right? You can understand with the, you could see with the physical eye and you could see with the eye of the mind. So when you talk about sight, sight would mean, I see it. So I see it means, oh, I get it. So that's actually probably gonna play into what we're about to say. So I'm glad you, you raised that. Thank you, Richard. Also in music, when you um, hear the sounds, you you can see images because there is a there is like a connection between different forms of art. You're saying in your brain, your your, your brain translates yeah. it. Yeah, that that musicologists agree on that. So when you hear the music, you 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 can you can see you can associate with different images. You can see. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, every person will see a different image. Another factor to bring in here, you can feel it when you hear something and when you see things, you internalize it and you feel it. It brings an emotion in you. So there's a third level that yeah. should be. A- yes. So we'll, we'll, that will, we're not going to address that directly, but I think that once we read the next uh, section or two, we'll, we'll get some insight into the feelings and what, and what, and what, the, what, the, what emotions are produced based on depending on what you see. Okay, so this is good. We got enough. We got enough ingredients on the table. We have enough pieces of the puzzle on the table. Now we just have to mix them all together, put them in the oven, and see what emerges. So what we're going to do here before we explain the the well, all the details that we need to explain why Rabbi Ishmael says this, why Rabbi Akiva says that, we're first going to explain the terms. When you say sight, what do you mean? When you say hearing, what do you mean? Now we're not necessarily talking about the physiology of this, what the, what the how the physical uh, um, um, waves of light or of sound travel. But we're going to talk about more the metaphoric. What does it mean to see? What does it mean to hear? So we're going to we're going to we're going to begin the journey, and then once we're done explaining the con- the terms, then we'll see. Right, and then it will then it will much be it will be easier to understand what Rabbi Akiva is saying, what Rabbi Shmuel is saying, and what turns out Rabbi Akiva who says the strange thing that they saw the sounds becomes the more obvious interpretation because that's what the verse says. And then we have to ask, why does Rabbi Yishmael who says that everything is normal, why is everything normal? 
So, but first we got to read, 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 read how we explain the concepts, the terms. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is possible to, so I skipped a little bit, as you see, I jumped to four, but I'm just trying to give, you know, make it, co make it uh, coherent um, without having to read everything because we don't have, because of the limitations of the time. It is possible to further clarify the above explanation, explaining two fundamental differences between the sense of sight and hearing. So he wanted to find two differences between the ability to see and the ability to hear. Number one, the first difference relates to the person seeing or hearing. In other words, the subject, the subject. We want to talk about the, the, the subjective experience. When I, what is the difference between if I see something or I hear something? So sight makes a deeper impression on the soul of the one who sees. And as a result, inspires greater certainty than hearing. No intellectual argument can ever convince a person who has seen something else with his eyes. Sight clarifies a matter and causes it to be imprinted on the soul with greater depth and certainty than one could do with his mind. This concept is reflected in the halachic ruling that is applied to day-to-day -day legal practice. A witness may not serve as a judge. Very interesting law. A witness cannot serve as a judge. What this law is telling you that a judge has to have an open mind, right? The judge is, is it's not just to figure out the truth. A judge has to be able to look at both sides of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the argument. The judge has to be able to be open to both opinions, both the plaintiff and the defendant. So if the judge has seen the event, you would say, perfect, you saw the event, you know what happened. You don't have to, you'll have to call less witnesses. You'll know the truth. It would be amazing. Let's put the judge on, let, let's, put the, let's put the judge who saw what happened, let him run the case. You say, no, because even though he knows what happened, the problem is he knows what happened. In other words, when you see something, it becomes reality to you. Somebody told you something, even if you trust them 100%. It does the imprint, the effect on you is not going to be as powerful than if you saw it. And everything in, in, in Judaism is, expresses itself in halacha, in the law. And this concept, that re'iyah, that the power of sight makes a deep impression on a person, even more than anything you'll tell me, is reflected in this law that the judge cannot become, uh, the witness cannot become a judge. In other words, a judge who witnessed the act cannot be the judge. Okay, so that is, that's one difference between sight and um, and, and, and hearing that when you see something, it makes a much deeper impression on the person seeing. Hearing does not leave that deep an imprint on the soul. Certainly intellectual understanding also refers to the analogy of hearing as in the Yiddish term deadheaded, does not have the same power to bring about the same certainty as sight. In Yiddish, in other words, in Jewish culture, when you say Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, doesn't quote that verse here, but that's what we're saying. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord is our God. What does it mean to hear? Hear means understand. And why do we use the term understanding? Why don't we say see? See, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The answer is we can't see it. We can understand it. And what the Rebbe is doing here is telling us that unlike what Richard said, which common people say is, I see what you're saying. You don't see what I'm saying. Because if you understand what I'm saying, you may agree with me, but you're not going to agree with me with that same certainty that you did if you saw it. If you saw it, it's, it's, to me, it's real. If I heard it, meaning if I understood it, it's wonderful. It's a theory. It's a thesis. I like it. I'm married. I like it. I accept it. It's wonderful. But I heard it. I didn't see it. And even understanding is hearing. It's not seeing. Seeing means I saw it with my physical eyes. It makes a much deeper impression on my soul. That's the first difference between sight and hearing. And we get to the second difference. The second difference relates to the object seen or heard. Sight focuses on, on a material entity. One sees its physical substance. By contrast, it is, it is impossible to hear a physical entity. Hearing responds to sound waves that are spiritual, i.e. not tangible, when compared to something that is seen. How much more so does this apply regarding understanding the ability to grasp abstract concepts? What are we saying here? We're saying that when you understand something, you're understanding an idea. The idea is spiritual. The object is physical, but the idea is spiritual. When you see something, what are you seeing? You're seeing the physicality of it. Now you'll argue that you see the light that bounces off the object, fine. But what you're seeing is the actual object. 
uh, when you're understanding something, when you hear something, when you understand something, you're not understanding the physicality of it, you're understanding the spiritual idea, the abstraction of it. An idea is spiritual versus uh, a table which is physical. Now what we're gonna say is these two points are interrelated, they're dependent one on the other. Why is it that sight leaves a deeper imprint on me? Because sight is a, because, because I am a physical person and therefore I respond to something physical. The idea, even if I understand it, is spiritual. And because it's spiritual and I'm physical, it does not affect me in the same way. So to summarize, we have two differences between sight and hearing, between seeing and hearing. Seeing has a deeper impact on me and seeing also affects the physical. Meaning I see the physical, I don't see the idea. I don't see something spiritual, I see something physical. As opposed to the hearing, which is a, hearing could be like hearing the and understanding that is I'm hearing and I'm hearing and understanding the spiritual aspect. And because I'm hearing and, and, and specifically because I'm hearing the spiritual aspect, that's why it doesn't leave as powerful as an imprint on me because I'm a, I'm a physical entity. I, I, I respond to physical stimuli more than spiritual stimuli. That's just the way we are, we're physical entities. So that's what we're getting here now. These two concepts are interrelated. These two differences between sight and hearing are, inter, are interdependent. I'm sorry, not to be interrelated, interdependent. One is dependent on the other. Since a human being is a physical entity, it is natural for him through sight to absorb and grasp other, another material entity in, in a closer and deeper way than a spiritual entity. For human beings are not capable of absorbing something spiritual thoroughly. Therefore, it is through hearing and through his mind that, the, that he absorbs the spiritual, which is further removed from his being. So you can convince me of any philosophy. You can convince me that God is one, okay? But is the fact that God is one, is that more real to me than I see a piece of steak on the table? No. You see a piece of steak, you're touching something, your eyes are, are absorbing something physical, and therefore the imprint on your soul is much deeper. This is reality. The idea, idea is an idea. And now we get to, now we could shift back to Sinai. And I'll put it out, to put out the idea, and then we'll read it inside. When you say that at Sinai, what is usually heard is seen. What is usually heard? Spirituality, ideas, the abstract is usually heard. At Sinai, what is usually heard was seen. The abstract, abstract spiritual ideas become like reality to you. They're seen in the sense that the imprint that they make on you is real. What's more real, the table or an idea? At Sinai, the idea is more real than the table. What is usually seen, which is spirituality, becomes as real to me, actually more real to me than the physical. And the physical, which is usually, which is usually seen, is heard. It's heard, it means, oh yeah, there's an abstract idea. Someone told me this physical reality, but it's not, it's not, it's not real. It's not real in the sense that it's not as real as something, as an idea. So that's the shift that happens at Sinai. We'll read it inside, we'll elaborate, but we understand that today. Today, we understand that, that uh, what our eye sees is not really reality. We see something, we see, look at the object, we see it looks like it's solid. Reality is it's not solid, right? So the question is, you can get to the point where the spiritual understanding of the makeup of the universe becomes real and what you see is just an idea. But even though you can understand it, it's, you don't really feel it. The imprint on your soul the way your eyes tell you has a much deeper impact on you than what your mind tells you. And that's the, that's the usual state of affairs. But at Sinai, when God's presence is revealed, it's not just that he told us 10 commandments, that too, he told us what to do. He gave us a manual to what to do, that's wonderful. But the experience of Sinai, according to Rabbi Akiva, we'll get to, we'll, we'll get to Rabbi Shmuel in a second, what the, what the experience of Sinai does is it changes our, the, the, what, 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 what impacts us. We used to be impacted. What was reality to us used to be what we saw. Now, no, what we see, meaning what really becomes real to us is what's usually heard. The ideas that are usually abstract become real. And here we have a Hasidic story. It's not in the talk, but I have to say it. It's one of those stories, Hasidic stories, very profound, but I apologize in advance. There's very little plot, but that's, that's the Hasidic stories. High on meaning, low on plot, but this is the story. Story is once upon a time, there are two people um, 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 talking, riding, riding on, on a horse, on a wagon drawn by horses. And they're talking about philosophy. 
And in the middle, they're, to, they're talking about angels. That's the story. There are two people in a wagon with a wagon driver leading the horses, and they're talking about angels. Sorry, I'm sorry. If you wait, if you if you were looking for some drama, you came onto the wrong Zoom. That's the story. What what do you do with this story? So the Hasidim say, let's analyze the theme. Let's analyze the, the scene. What is happening here? What's real for these people? So for these two people, they want to go to the big city because they want to invest in the in in in, in, in do some business. They're very smart. So on the way, they want to talk philosophy. They want to talk ideas. They're talking about angels. That's reality for them. The angels. What is reality for the wagon driver? The wagon driver doesn't know anything about the business, doesn't know about the, anything about the angels or about the business. He wants to go to that city so he can get his paycheck at the end of the road. For him, the reality is the paycheck. What are the horses? Why are they running? Why are they running? Well, you know why the horses are running? Because at the end, they're going to get hay. That's reality for them. That's all they understand. So then the conclusion of this beautiful story is that Hasidim would say, just because the horses are thinking about, hey, the angels aren't angels. In other words, what is reality depends on what you what, what, depends on what 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 is real to you, and it's different for the it's a subjective experience. For this guy, it's the it's the horse. For that guy, it's the angel. But what we're saying here is ultimately, for a human being, what's real is what you see. The angels aren't really aren't really cannot be real for you, even if you understand that they exist. But at Sinai, everything is flipped on is flipped on the head. On Sinai, what is usually heard, the abstract ideas spirituality becomes as real to you as what is seen. So you see the sounds, meaning you see what is usually heard, right? right, right. Rabbi Akiva is clear. He doesn't say you see the sounds. The verse says that. He, sees, he says, we, we see what is usually heard. What is usually heard is, what is usually heard is, um, what is usually heard is spiritual ideas. And seeing that is that the spiritual ideas become real to you as if you saw it. That's Rabbi Akiva. Now we understand why, why this happened at Sinai, because this great revelation, which is a revelation of godliness, so it becomes real to us as if we saw it. So we read it inside. Now Rabbi Akiva makes full sense. Now the question is, so why does Rabbi Shmuel say, you stood at Sinai, and the tuna sandwich was more real to you than God? Isn't that, I mean, that's just sort of like anticlimactic, because Rabbi Shmuel says, no, no, no. You saw what is usually seen. You heard what is usually heard. Rabbi Shmuel says, there's no change at Sinai. Why not? Why can't you just join the bandwagon of Rabbi Akiva? It's much more exciting. You're seeing the sounds. You're seeing what is usually heard. Spirituality becomes real to you. It's wonderful. No, Rabbi Shmuel doesn't want any. He doesn't want any part of that party. Okay, so let's read. Um, when ordinarily, when ordinary rea um, reality ga gave way, this represents one of the innovations that the giving of the Torah brought about. It generated the potential to see what is usually heard and hear what is usually seen. What is usually heard, the spiritual and the godly intangibles that can't be seen and can be appreciated only through hearing was able to be seen, accepted by the Jewish people with certainty and concrete perception engendered by sight. They saw godliness. What was usually seen, physical entities, our material world was, was then only heard. It was an entity that is distant, as it were, and could not and could be conceived of only abstractly. And now we understand one of the questions that we skipped, we didn't read, is we said, why does God make this special miracle that uh, um, um, you see the sounds? The answer is not. It's not. It's not a separate miracle. This is essential to the giving of a Torah. If God would reveal His presence, then, then yes, then godliness, which is usually abstract, becomes reality. So it's not a separate entity from the giving of a Torah. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a byproduct. On this basis, it can also be understood that the miracle of seeing what is usually heard was not an external matter intrinsically unrelated to the revelation of the giving of a Torah, but was an integral element of the revelation. At the giving of a Torah, the Jews experienced the revelation of, of, of God's very essence. Anachi Hashem the Lord your God. We're going to skip the commentary. Because of that revelation, the Jews then saw what was usually heard. They related to godliness and spirituality with sight. It became their visible reality. As a natural consequence, they heard what was usually seen. The physical aspects of our world lost their prominence as the perceptible reality. They were merely heard, abstractly understood. Right? If godliness is real, then physical is takes second. Physicality takes takes uh, second second um, second place. Right, the Hasidim say that it depends which world you are. If you're li living in this world, you can debate whether or not spirituality exists. 
But if you're an angel, if you're living in the spiritual reality, they're sitting there as we're studying now on Zoom, they're sitting there and debating. Someone told them that there's such a thing of a physical reality where you don't sense godliness. And everyone says, nah, it's too hard to believe, right? Because they have the different, they have a different perception. If spirituality is real, if godliness is real, then physical physical reality has to, something that that is not that is could be understood, but it can't be felt. So now we understand beautifully why at the giving of a Torah, if God's essence is revealed, everything is flipped. What is usually seen, the spiritual becomes, what is usually heard, the spiritual that's abstract becomes seen, becomes real. And the physical, which is usually seen, becomes secondary. It's not as important. It's heard, it's an abstract concept. Yes, someone told me that eating cotton candy tastes good. I, I can't imagine it, but that's what's, yeah, I, you actually, you could convince me of it, but it's not real to me the way um, becoming close to God is good. Oh, that's real. That's at the giving of the Torah. Okay, if we put up such a beautiful argument to explain why they saw the sounds, and that's the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. So what is Rabbi Ishmael's opinion? That no, everything was the same. They saw that it sounds, they heard what is heard, uh, the, meaning to say everything was the same. Godliness was abstract, physical reality was real. So what's the big deal? I mean, I mean, um, this is why we came to Sinai, so everything should be the same. So that's read. Apizah, on this basis, it is necessary to consider the opinion of Rabbi Ishmael. How does the fact that the Jews saw what is usually seen and heard what is usually heard, seemingly the prevailing pattern within the natural order, represent an elevated state? We, should, we assume when you come to the giving of the Torah, you, uh, we, we, the universe is elevated. So now what's the elevated state that we're back to normal? What's, what's the point? And how was that an appropriate backdrop to the giving of the Torah, the quintessential state of loftiness? In resolution, it can be explained. So this is a very big Hasidic idea. The big Hasidic idea is that the purpose of any divine revelation is to affect the physical reality, not to escape the physical reality. So if God's presence makes the world change of its natural order, then it defeats the purpose. The purpose is not to change the natural order. The purpose is that the way nature is on its own, it should be affected by godliness. So Rabbi Ishmael says, no, 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 we don't want the physical person to lose the physical properties. Where materialism is real and spirituality is abstract. You have to maintain that because if you don't maintain that, we all became angels. We all became spiritual entities. That's not the purpose of the, the Torah. The Torah is not here to make you an angel. The Torah is here to make you a sanctified human being but and, and to affect the, and to sanctify the nature, not to escape it, not to, not, not to destroy it. So Rabbi Ishmael says, no, you cannot you cannot ultimately, um, you cannot ultimately um, create, you don't want that, that the giving of the Torah, which represents the highest possible state that humanity can reach, you don't want a, a state where anything is unnatural, because that would be defeating the purpose of the Torah. People, purpose of the Torah is to sanctify the nature, not to escape it and not to destroy it. And all of a sudden, oh, Rabbi Ishmael, who says everything is normal, now we understand why he's saying what he says. So we have two modes of what's happening. Rabbi Akiva says, when God reveals his presence, spirituality becomes real to you. And that's what Rabbi Akiva, that's the lifestyle Rabbi Akiva wants. And Rabbi Shmuel says, no, we don't want that to happen. What Rabbi Akiva is so excited about, Rabbi Shmuel says, that would be a tragedy. That means we're now no longer human. That means we're no longer natural. We want nature. We want the world to exist on its own terms. And we want to sanctify that. But the world has to exist on its own terms. That's the big debate. Later, we get to why each one says what he says. But that's the cherry on the top. Whoops. Okay. Oh, so here we go. In resolution, it can be explained. In other words, we want to explain. Oh, I didn't share it. I thought I shared it. So now we want to explain the opinion of Rabbi Ishmael, which says, no, everything is normal. In resolution, it can be explained that the new development brought about by the giving of the Torah is reflected by the verse, God descended on Mount Sinai. In other words, God, it's not that God's making us angels. God is coming down to our reality. God wants to sanctify our reality. In the words of the Medrash, at that time, and from that time onward, the higher realm would descend to the lower realm. And when God said, I will, and God said, I will begin, i.e. God himself initiated the process of drawing down godliness into the lower realms, into our material world, and more specifically into the world as it remains within its natural framework. This is a big idea. According to Hasidic philosophy, the whole purpose of creation is to sanctify the physical world. God wanted a dwelling place in the lowest um, space. And the lowest space is the most natural space where godliness is not obvious. 
In the spiritual worlds, God is obvious. That's not a low, lowly state. So this is a big idea. So at the giving of the Torah, what is the giving of the Torah? God descends. It says he comes down. What does it mean he comes down? God is everywhere. Comes down means he is accepted within our reality. He is understood within our reality, but it doesn't destroy our reality. The ultimate goal is that notwithstanding the, the, the materiality of the world, through the Torah, here in this world, the Jews will be able to perceive the giver of a Torah, i.e. relate to godliness. Relate to godliness when the world and the person is in their natural state, which is a state of, of, of a physical state where physicality is real and spirituality is abstract. Accordingly, Rabbi Ishmael maintains that at the time of the giving of the Torah, the Jews remain within the natural framework that governs our world. Nevertheless, within that framework, they experience the ultimate spiritual peaks. Even though they still saw what is usually seen and heard what is usually heard, at the giving of a Torah, their very sight and hearing was permeated by the truth of God. Okay, we're going to skip this because this is a commentary that I didn't say. Right? this. They trembled and stood from afar. Okay, beautiful. This is the big idea. And now we want to, hopefully, if we have time, we'll connect it to the names. And I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what we can do after that. There's two more parts. We have to connect it to the other disagreement, which you probably won't do. And we also have to examine what Rashi says, because Rashi seems to be picking and choosing. So there's a lot more to do, but I don't want to, we don't want to do too much in one in one shot. Just to put it out here and to summarize, we have two philosophies of what should happen when God gives the Torah, when God descends on Mount Sinai, when God's presence is revealed. Rabbi Ishmael, which by the way, when we heard, first heard him was more, I'm sorry, Rabbi Ak what, what does the matter say first? When we, the opinion that said, okay, so let, let us, without going into there. The one opinion is they heard what is usually heard. They saw what is usually seen. Let's start with the other one, it's easier. Rabbi Akiva, who reads the word verse literally. So it's interesting that the verse really implies what, what, what Rabbi Akiva says. That's the natural, that's the first thing you would think of. That when God reveals his presence, what is usually heard abstraction, spiritual ideas become seen. They become real to us. And what is usually seen, the physical reality becomes abstract, becomes less important. That is what Rabbi Akiva says. Rabbi Ishmael says no. Rabbi Ishmael says that wouldn't be the purpose. The purpose of the giving of the Torah is to remain within, to sanctify the reality, but remain within the natural reality. And therefore, even at the giving of the Torah, what is usually seen spirituality, I'm sorry, what is usually seen, physical reality is seen. It still remains, it still has the, the primary impact on us and our definition of reality. And what is heard, which is spiritual reality, is heard, it's still abstract. And in that realm, in the world the way we are, in the world the way it is in its natural state, that's where the Torah wants to affect us. That's what, where the Torah, that's what the Torah wants to sanctify. Not to create, not to change our perception and make us spiritual entities. No, we, we're people who were more moved by physical than spiritual. And yet we could sanctify the physical. Yet we could relate to God, the giver of the Torah. So that's the big dispute between the two. Okay, the fun begins, ladies and gentlemen. The fun continues, I should say. Next step in the game, next step in the journey is to figure out why Rabbi Ishmael says what he says and Rabbi Akiva says what he says. Rabbi Ishmael is the one, Rabbi Akiva is the one who says that when the world, at Sinai, everything changes, we become spiritual entities. Rabbi Ishmael says, no, at Sinai, everything is the same. Okay, what's the difference between the service and path, life path of Rabbi Ishmael and the life path of Rabbi Akiva? So, what do we know about Rabbi Ishmael? Rabbi Ishmael was a high priest. So we're going to put him in the path of righteous. He's a person who's in this world and he's a righteous person. He's always doing the right thing. In the length, that's, 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 that's Rabbi Ishmael. From youth, he was always in the right path, the right path of righteousness. Rabbi Akiva, his family history and his own life is a different path. He, first of all, he descends from converts. So he's coming from unholiness to holiness. Secondly, he only started studying Torah at 40. So he's got a late start. He needs a lot more energy and passion to be able to overcome the missing year, so to speak. He is what we would call a Baal Teshuvah, someone who's returning from the distance. That's why Rabbi Akiva is a very sad story, um, but it's an 
enlightening story, a story about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was one of the 10 martyrs that the Romans killed. And they killed many more than 10, but 10 sages that they killed. And the Talmud tells the story that when the Romans were torturing him and killing him, he was laughing, he was smiling. And the students say, how could you be smiling if the Romans are killing you? And he said like this, he says, my whole life, I was, mitzvah, I was in pain. When will I be able to sacrifice my life to God? Because we say in the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. So every day, twice a day, I say, I love my God with all, I love God with all my soul. But I was, every day I was in pain. When can I give my soul to God? And finally, now I have the opportunity. What, I shouldn't be happy? So what do we see about Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva is somebody who, for whatever reason, his, spirit, his spiritual journey is trying to escape the world, trying to transcend. Rabbi Yishmael is righteous. He's not trying to run away from the world. He's not trying to run away from the negativity. To the contrary, his job is to bring holiness into the reality. And therefore, when they study, start studying Torah and they feel that we're coming to the climatic part of, of history where God descends at Sinai, what happens? Well, it depends what, what your understanding of, of, of Judaism is, what your understanding of service of God is, and what your personal path is. Rabbi Ishmael's personal path is to bring holiness into the world, says, you know what? We want God to come into the world. We don't want the world to change. Rabbi Akiva, who every day is trying to escape the world, because that's his spiritual path, because he senses the negativity within the world, and that drives him to escape the physical, the physical, the, the physical realm. Rabbi, and, and to the extent that he wants to die, he can't die because you're not allowed to kill yourself. God wants you to be here. But he wants to escape. And when finally the Romans are helping him, he says, oh, he's very happy. So when he sees the, the giving of the Torah and he sees the verse, seeing the sounds, he's wonderful. I want the world to change. I want to be in a place where we don't sense the physical as real, where the spiritual becomes real. That's an extension. His understanding of this verse is an extension of his spiritual service of God. And now we understand not only that they disagree, but why they disagree, because there's two spiritual paths. And in some sense, we each have a spiritual, we, have, we each have a little bit of both, but that will be the next point. So let's read this inside. And then if we hopefully we'll make a dash for the final point. Um, um, hopefully we'll make a dash. Okay, so let's read. So why does each one say what they what they say? Their positions stem from their personal background. Rabbi Ishmael was a Kohen, and according to some opinions, a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, either a priest or a high priest. A Kohen is naturally and inherently sanctified unto his God. His divine service is carried out according to the pattern of the divine service of tzaddikim, of the righteous. Accordingly, based on that inherent spiritual disposition and path of divine service, he experienced the ultimate peak of divine service as seeing what is usually seen and hearing what is usually heard, thus drawing down godliness into our world, which remains on its lowly material plane within the structures of the natural order. This is the structured path of the divine service carried out by tzaddikim to draw godliness down into the, into the lowly plane. Ironically, the righteous person is not escaping the world because he's very happy in the world because the negativity of the world, he never interacted with the negativity in the world. So he's perfectly fine being here, doing all the good deeds, drawing light into this world. Rabbi Akiva's divine service followed the pattern of teshuva, repentance or return. He was descended from converts and began studying the Torah only at the age of 40. Therefore, his divine service was characterized by the mode of teshuva, seeking to rise above the world. In this vein, we find that throughout his life, Rabbi Akiva had a desire from a sidrus nefesh for martyrdom, to give over his life to God, to actually sacrifice his life in the sanctification of God's name. As he explained, all my days I have been agitated about the verse, love God with all your soul, which I interpreted as meaning, even if he, he has your soul taken. I would say to myself, when will I have the opportunity to fulfill this charge? Now that the opportunity is being afforded to me, should I not fulfill it? It's not the perfect translation. I shouldn't be happy, right? So what do we see? We see here that because um, Rabbi Akiva wants to escape, so, what, so therefore, that's why when it comes to the giving of a Torah, he says, yes, the world is going to change. The world is, gonna, is, gonna, the world is going to, is going to um, be different than it usually is. Now, what we're going to get to now is, is, is like this. We're going to get to like this, that it, really there's two paths. You could be a path of the person who wants to bring God into this world. Mostly you're the person who draws light, light into this world. Or you could be a person who wants to escape, who wants to transcend, who wants to pray, who wants to go above the, the physical reality. Um, is basically a path for both. What's fascinating here, and this is very interesting, and this is very powerful. What we're going to do is like this. We're going to open Rashi. And Rashi 
is almost contradictory, but we don't see why he's contradictory because we didn't learn the other disagreement. But he's contradictory, at least what we know so far, he only quotes the first half. Let's read Rashi. Let's go back to the, let's go back to Rashi. And the people saw the voices. The voices, they saw what is audible, which is impossible to see elsewhere from Mechilta. Okay, what does Rashi say? Rashi goes with the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. At Mount Sinai, they saw what is usually heard, meaning spirituality, which is usually heard, they saw that. Spirituality became real. That's what, that's what, uh, that's what Rashi says. What's interesting about this Rashi? What's interesting is that he doesn't say what Rabbi Akiva said. Rabbi Akiva says the next step. Rabbi Akiva says, not only they saw what is heard, but they also heard what is seen. In other words, physicality becomes less important. Rashi doesn't say that. Why doesn't Rashi bring the whole statement of Rabbi Akiva? So what the Rebbe is going to say is like this. What the Rebbe says is absolutely brilliant. Rashi says, I'm writing my book for a young student, for a five-year-old student. Rashi is talking about the Jew in the beginning of his service. In the beginning of your divine service, you can reach the level that physicality is secondary. We're physical people. We care about the physical world. Maybe you can get to that. You can get to that level of Rabbi Akiva. You can grow. You can reach that level, but not in the beginning of your service. However, in the beginning of, even in the beginning of your service, you could get to the level and you can educate your children to get to the level that at times, at the giving of a Torah, at times, spirituality should be real to them. So this is interesting. Rabbi Akiva says they work together. If spirituality is real, then physicality is secondary, is less important. That's true if you do this fully. But Rashi doesn't say that. Rashi doesn't say that the physicality is secondary. Rashi doesn't say that they heard what is seen. Rashi does say they saw what is heard. And what the Rebbe is going to say, Rashi is telling you that even in the beginning of your service, even if you want to follow the path of Rabbi Akiva, which is the, which is the spiritual path, in the, even in the beginning of your service, I'm not at the point where materialism is meaningless to me, where materialism is secondary to me. No, I want, I, 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 materialism is real to me. I want a comfortable life. I want a comfortable house. I want a comfortable car. Whatever else you want is wonderful. Materialism is real to you. That's fine. But even in that state, you can get to the point and where you start from is that spirituality should be real. And that is accessible to everybody. And that's so brilliant how you see that in the words of Rashi, who quotes only the first half of Rabbi Akiva and not the second half. Okay, so this is a lot, a lot going on here, but this, this piece I've got, I've got to read inside is too much fun. Now I'm skipping because what the Rebbe is doing now is merging both the other disagreement with the yes, yes, and the no, no, but I want to leave that alone for right now. Let's get to the end because we are running out of time. As mentioned above, in his commentary on the Torah, Rashi quotes only the first clause of Rabbi Akiva's description of the events at Sinai. That was one of the questions at the beginning. If Rashi is reading, according to Rabbi Akiva, bring the whole clause. Say, what is they heard what is seen, and they saw what is heard. But Rashi doesn't do that. Rashi only puts the first half, not the second half. Although the two states are interrelated, as explained above. Rashi omits the second clause. The rationale for the omission can be explained as follows. As mentioned on several occasions, first and foremost, Rashi composes commentary to present Pshutei Shal Mikra, which is the straightforward meaning of a Torah verse, so that even a five-year-old beginning his Torah study could understand what the Torah is saying. That's what Rashi says. I'm here, I'm Anila Basi, I'm here to, to speak to the, to the simple interpretation of a Torah. And we know the simple interpretation of Torah, you begin studying when you're five years old. That's what the Mishnah says, Ben Chamesh and Mikra, uh, five years old, you start studying scripture. So Rashi is talking to the elementary, uh, elementary level. While the two approaches and modes of divine service described above, that of Rabbi Ishmael, the divine service of Tzadikim, and that of Rabbi Akiva, the divine service of Bali Teshuvah, are appropriate for Jews who are in the midst of their divine service. Rashi composes commentary for the five-year-old. And such a child must begin serving God in the manner of chinuch, education, thus taking the first steps in cultivating and, and, and fostering his personal development. At this stage, a child cannot be asked to do more than to see what is usually heard. He should train himself, starting his divine service with the directive stated at the beginning of the first section of the Shulchan Aruch Arachayim, which is the code of law, which also serves an introduction to the entire Shulchan Aruch. What's the first law the Torah says? What's the first law of the code of law? Code of law, it tells you that you wake up, it tells the laws of waking up in the morning, 
When you wake up in the morning, you should, she, the verse quotes, Shiviti Hashem I place God before me always. Always place God before you. In other words, always be cognizant of the existence of God who's, 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 who's present. Um, most shuls, certainly Ashkenazic shuls, have that written on the chazan's podium. Shiviti Hashem Negdi Tamid, inscribed. I place God before me always. The Hasidim didn't do it. They asked, that's another story. But in any case, that's the first thing you're going to say in the code of law. Be cognizant of the, of the divine reality. God is present in your life. I place God before me at all times. This implication of the implication of that service is that the recognition of godliness, something that is usually heard, should be seen. To express the concept, barring Hasidic terminology, elokut, godliness, should be vipshitus, grasp simple, simply as the person's natural perception. In other words, in the beginning of your service, what we can tell you, we can't tell you that your toys, either literal toys or figurative toys, like right, they say about toys, they say the difference between children and adults is the adults, the toys are more expensive, right? So you can't get people in the beginning of the divine service to say my toys should be less, less, less meaningful to me, that my physical reality should be, should be abstract, should be secondary. That's you may reach the level of Rabbi Yishmael, but of Rabbi Akiva, but we're not there yet. But what we could always tell you is that the first section of the Code of Law, Shiviti Hashem I place God before me. God's presence, spirituality is reality. It's real to me. That you can do immediately, even before um, you reach the level where materialism is less important. Um, so here we go. Um, where are we? The above also holds true to an adult in terms of the divine service. Is on a level of a five-year-old beginning his Torah study, right? We don't, we don't, we don't mean five-year-old literally. We mean, we don't mean by age on the passport. We mean the beginning of your divine service at any age. The, be, the beginning, what is demanded, such a person must also have, begin serve, serving God and carrying out the process through his chinuch education, training himself and developing his spiritual potential. Develop the spiritual muscle that is able to recognize that, re, that spirituality is real. At this early stage, such beginners cannot be asked to function at the level of hearing what is usually seen. It is impossible to ask them not to see matters of this world to relate to material reality with distance, merely hearing it. To again borrow, borrow Hasidic terminology, to regard ordinary existence shoots as a novelty, right? What is real and what's the novelty? So at some point, godliness is real. In the higher worlds, godliness is real. And the world is the novelty. The world is the news. For us, the world is reality. And godliness is the novelty. What could you do in the beginning of your service? The beginning of your service, you could do the first half, not the second half. In other words, godliness could be real. Yes, the world could be novelty. The world could be secondary. The world could be the news. That is much harder. Speaking straightforwardly, in other words, in simple words. A five-year-old beginning the Torah study understands simply that he must study the Torah and observe mitzvot. Indeed, this is so straightforward for him that he does not have to force himself to do this. On the other hand, at the same time, material matters, eating, drinking, and the like, also come simply for, for they are entirely natural to him. He is not yet at the stage that he can bring himself not to be concerned about material matters at all and be involved in them solely for the sake of heaven. In other words, a child and not only a child in age, but a child in the beginning of the service of God, in the beginning of your spiritual journey. You're not going to begin from the point where materialism is not important, where you're only engaged in material life just for the sake of God. That you have to read Tanya Perik, Perik, the seventh chapter that we read on Friday to reach that level. But that's not for the five-year-old. That's not the beginning of the service. But what the beginning of the service is that you fulfill the Torah, you do the mitzvah, you study Torah, because for you, godliness is real. And spirituality is real in your life. You see what is usually heard? What is usually heard spirituality is true for you. Yes, materialism is also, you also see the food and drink. You also see materialism. But the big news is you also see what is usually heard. Okay. I think we'll stop here. There's a lot, a lot to, a lot, we're going, a lot to say, a lot to, a lot to, a lot, a lot to think about. Just to summarize quickly is we, we put out this disagreement in the beginning between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva, one opinion says at Sinai, they saw what is seen, they heard what is heard. We translated that to mean that, let's start with the other side. The other side said, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva said, they heard, they saw what is heard and they heard what is seen. We translated that to mean that what is usually heard, what is usually heard, spirituality becomes real to them. And what is usually seen, physicality becomes secondary, becomes less important. 
it's like an idea. Oh yeah, it's a nice idea. It's not real to me. It's not as real as something that I've seen. So, and we said that Rabbi Yishmael says, no, everything stays the same because the purpose of creation is to sanctify the physical world as it is. And that's the debate. And now each person of us, the Rebbe doesn't get into that, but each person of us has both. At some points, we're supposed to try to escape the world, ultimately to return. So some points we have the, we have the, the service of Rabbi Akiva escaping. Other times we want to return and sanctify the world. So we have a little bit of both. But Rashi, the beginner student says, beginning of the service, don't try to be within the world. Try to be a point where, you are, where you're transcending. But transcending does not mean that physicality is not real to you. That's wonderful if you can get to that level. In other words, if you're truly spiritual, you may get, reach to that level where the physical matter is not as important to you as your spiritual life. But that's not the beginning. The beginning is, like the code of law says, Shiviti Hashem the God is real in your life. Spirituality is real in your life. What is usually seen, abstract ideas, to you is real. And that affects your day. That affects why you study Torah, why you do the mitzvot, because to you, uh, it's not just an abstract idea, it's real to you. And that is accessible to everybody, even at the beginning of your path, even if you fight five-year-old child, either literally or figuratively in the service of God. At any point, you can get to the point you could implement within your life the revelation of the Torah and the experience of Sinai, at least the beginning of it, where what is usually heard, spirituality, becomes reality to you. That's the story in short on one foot. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Chaim. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, but I, I didn't quite get the uh, the point about uh, Rabbi Akiva and the beginning of service of, of, of God. So um, according to Rabbi, even Rabbi Akiva, the beginning of his service was on the level of child, or he was like that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, my question is more related to how is Balshuva, it's more natural for them to to feel it from the start or just at the end, like yes. at the end of life, like Rabbi Akiva did. We're using Baal Shuba here differently than we usually use it. What we mean with Rabbi Akiva is his attitude is he wants to escape the world. Why does he want to escape the world? So the answer is because his experience was a lot of his life and the history of his family was a place of spiritual emptiness or spiritual darkness. So his response to that is he wants to run away. Rabbi Akiva doesn't want to run away. Rabbi Yishmael doesn't want to run away from everybody, anything. He's perfectly fine. He grew up in a righteous environment. He grew up in the temple. Everything is holy. Everything is wonderful. What's the problem? So he's not running anywhere. Rabbi Akiva is the response to someone who senses the void and the darkness in the world. And not everybody's like that. But to him, the response was, I want, I want to get out of here. In the language of the Kabbalah, there's running and returning. Now, in our life, we each have a little bit. In the beginning of a day, we try to run. And then we try to return. We try to say Shema. Think about giving, devoting our life to God, but then we come back to the world to live in the life. That's, that's the balance. But there are some people at the extremes that are, they, they, they're supposed to do one or the other. So Rabbi Yishmael doesn't have to escape the world because for him, the world is holy. He doesn't have to go anywhere. He doesn't have to run. He could be in the business of returning. Rabbi Akiva has such a passion for God that he doesn't want to be in the business of returning. He's forced to, he does it, but that's not where his heart is. He wants to escape. We People sitting, in other words, most people are going to do a little bit of each because we want to have the balance. But what we're saying is in the beginning of your service, you can't, you can't actually start with Rabbi Yishmael. You can't educate a child and say, just be in the world, just be natural. No, we want you to, 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 to reach Rabbi Yishmael. You have to do, you, in other words, you first, have to, you first have to be in a point where the world is holy if you want to remain in the world. Most people, you have to escape before you can return. You have to realize you have to have a sense of spirituality before you can return. So most people can't do either Rabbi Yishmael or Rabbi Akiva. Most people have to do both or start with Rabbi Akiva and then transition to Rabbi Yishmael. That's actually interesting. You first one, then, then you return. And that's why in the beginning of the service, Rashi doesn't tell the child, oh, just be natural. No, don't tell a child to be natural. Tell a child to elevate himself. But how do you elevate yourself? You're not going to do what Rabbi Akiva is doing. You're not telling the child, I want you to get to the point where a relationship with God and study of Torah is important to the extent that your toys are not important. You can't tell him that. For him, eating, drinking are important. What you could say is your relationship with God should be just as important as your breakfast. Ah, that he could listen to, that he can do. And not just the child, but us, we're also children. We're also in the beginning of the service of God. So what are you going to do? I don't care about the physical world. Yeah, if you can, if you can, I only, I only engage in the physical world to serve God. Yeah, if you can do that, very good. You're on an advanced spiritual level. But even if you're not, what we could tell you is place God before you. The first sentence of the code of law. It's not the last thing. It's the first thing. God is, is, is place God before you. God's reality should be real to you. 
And that's true for every, that's true for at any time you can you can achieve that. And that's the beauty of Rashi's interpretation. It's he's he's really giving this two interpretations. Rashi gives half of one because he's talking to us in the beginning of the service. And that is how you read Rashi. Rashi is interpreting the verse, but Rashi also has spiritual mysticism within it. And that's what the Rebbe always saw. Anytime he interpreted Rashi, it was multidimensional. Rashi is interpreting the verse, but he's also inter- giving us a lesson in the service of God. So again, we, we didn't even finish. We did, I, I would say we did 70% of the talk, but it's, uh, this, is, this, is one of my, this, is one of, this is one of the most beautiful ones, in my opinion. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's beautiful on many levels. So I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Thank you so much for joining. I'm very grateful because uh, it's hard to get into it alone. When I when everybody's here, you know, you feel the energy and you get into it, and the spirit and the sounds become real. That's what happens when everybody joins. The sounds become real, and the Torah becomes comes to life, and it's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. And it's also beautiful that that in arts it's also read the way. So it's only sound produce the image. It's not the other way around. Right. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Be well.